bench pressing down on you, and you're trying to make a living as an organism. <laughs> so, you know, the abyss really is probably about the frontiers of life, frontiers of human exploration, and as uh, Kathy explained, probably the frontiers of filmmaking as well, from James Cameron's point of view. So what I want to do just in the next sort of 10 or 15 minutes is just give you a sense of why, th in my opinion, this film was groundbreaking. Try to give you a sense of some of the wonder of the deep ocean. You know, why do scientists go there? What are the challenges? Some of the pressures that are on the deep ocean at the moment, and I've got one particular case example, which is the, the learning moment to go away with that you'll uh, discuss over a beer later this evening. And then finally to just show you a little bit of where art meets reality because there's a sequence in the Cameron film which was really quite prescient from, uh, from Cameron's perspective. Uh, I don't want to give too much away but when you see the end of my short presentation uh, you'll reflect on a particular moment and uh, as Cathy said, this, was, this, this film was uh, made back in 1989, but he actually had these ideas when he was 17 years old. Uh, he always was interested in the, in the ocean, in technology, and various aspects associated with it. So this is how we as oceanographers and marine scientists think of the planet. You know, actually, pretty much over the... Uh, 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 top of Tahiti, looking down on the uh, Pacific Ocean. 72% of the planet is covered in water at, at the surface, but 98% of the living space on the planet is in the ocean. So if we think where life is, 98% of it from the surface of the ocean to the abyss and even into the sediments and rocks below is where life exists. The, the, the land is a small proportion. We don't really know very much about it. You know, back in the 14th century, when uh, people were making the first maps of the ocean, the surface ocean, uh, this was a very uh, popular little piece that used to fill in the blank space of the, the map. The uh, cartographer had to sort of indicate uh, to mariners of that time that this was uncharted territory in the oceans. And this was the surface of the ocean, remember, not the, the deep ocean. And... Uh, here be dragons actually turns out to also be quite uh, forward thinking. I actually flipped it upside down to look like the, uh, the diagram on the, on, the, on the map. But this is a frilled shark. It's actually a deep water shark. It was brought up to the surface in a marine park uh, off the coast of Japan. And, uh, you know, this is an amazing creature. Unfortunately, it didn't live very long. Um, and we've, we've only recorded it twice. Uh, in, uh, in history, uh, in, in the history of science. And yet, you know, it, it probably may have been one of the inspirations for those early cartographers. So I'm just going to take you just a few minutes on some of the other weird and wonderful things that are down there. How about this one? <laughs> the blobfish. <laughs> I think that's definitely living up to its uh, reputation. Those of you who've got good eyes can see the little nematode crawling into the bottom right-hand corner of its mouth. How about the cockroach of the sea? I don't have a scale on here, but if you have this running around on your kitchen floor, I don't think many of us would stay there. It's about two feet long. <laughs> and then there are other things down there, you know, and I'm going to come back to this point, this uh, light, because... Down there in the deep ocean, there is no light. And yet some of these creatures will use light uh, to attract their prey to, uh, as a warning signal, even maybe even to find their mate. Can you imagine the challenge of trying to find your mate down there in 30,000 feet of blackness and cold? You know, that's a challenge for anyone. How about this one? A, a Pompeii bristle worm. So that's a scanning electron microscope. You've zoomed in about uh, 5,000 times to, to look at the mouth parts, the, the feeding part of this bristle worm. Happens to be adapted to li living in other extreme conditions near 
the so-called hydrothermal systems or the hot springs that are on the seafloor. And probably my favorite one from the census of marine life, the Yeti crab. <laughs> this is almost a, a cult organism now. We didn't know much about Yeti crabs until the census of marine life came along. But since that time, you can, those of you who are aficionados or want to Google on Google Images, you'll find this on skateboards, on coffee mugs, travel bags, beach towels. <laughs> it is a great organism. Okay, we're going back to the blackness now. So Cameron was pretty interested in, in the technologies and so on. Um, he, he got interested when he, uh, when he was uh, making uh, Alien 1, and he was starting to read about some of the remotely operated vehicles that were operating in the deep ocean. I mean, oceanographers consider the deep ocean to be easy and compared to, uh, dip, outer space to be easy and compared to the deep ocean. In outer space, you're in a vacuum. That's, that's a piece of cake. In the deep ocean, pressure, corrosion, because it's a salty environment, chemicals you know, that leach out and do things, organisms that come and stick onto your, your spaceship, your underwater vehicle, all kinds of problems facing someone in the deep ocean. But Cameron was fascinated with this, and he started to sort of play with the idea of whether man would actually start to, you know, essentially explore the deep ocean in order to uh, derive um, economic wealth, as we shall see in the abyss. Man's exploration of the deep ocean uh, goes right the way back to the early 60s with the, with the Alvin submersible, located not far from here at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. That's actually the Alvin going through a major refit, which has happened over the last two years. And you can just about, uh, you see the person up at the top uh, near the red conning tower, and below that, that metallic looking sphere is uh, a solid, t well, a titanium sphere, and the walls are over two feet thick to withstand the pressure. And three people climb into that sphere, and then will spend nine hours going two and a half miles down to the bottom of the ocean. And then down there on the bottom of the ocean, they will maneuver the submarine around with, with the manipulator arms to be able to explore the, the sea floor. And here's a rather unique photograph of Alvin taken from another submersible. This doesn't happen very often. It's actually taken through the window of the Mir submersible, one of the Russian ones, uh, just to indicate what that experience is like deep down on the sea floor, something like six hours to get back to the surface from that point. So I'm going to show you an image now which sort of resonates with the film The Abyss. Now, this is actually real life now. You're actually looking at a seafloor mining instrument in Gateshead on Tyneside in Great Britain three months ago. And the reason that is there, and you'll see some of these in, in the abyss, is because of this thing that I'm holding up here. You've all got one of these mobile phones. What is the connection between mobile phones and the abyss, and more particularly deep sea mining? And it's because in all of our electronic gadgets, we need rare minerals, specifically rare earth elements. I could list them all. Scandium, yttrium, lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, europium, dysprosium, holmium. I'm reciting part of the periodic table for which those elements are absolutely vital for our modern electronics industry. 95% of rare earth elements are found in China. So you guess what, you know, as far as the, the Western Hemisphere nations are concerned, that represents a strategic issue associated with where the raw materials are going to come from for the electronics <coughs> industry. So there is actually now underway plans for deep sea mining, just like in the abyss. It turned out to be an oil rig in, uh, in the abyss in the film we're going to see. But here is the deep sea mining in real life, and it's going to take place off Papua New Guinea in the Pacific. The problem is we hardly understand what the environmental impacts of deep sea mining are, and yet we've been licensing that area. I mean, obviously, the government of Papua New Guinea need to 
find ways to use their natural resources for the benefit of their people. But I, I feel that our science and our understanding of the deep ocean is only at a very earlier stage before we start embarking in such ventures. So I wanted to make that connection back to you for this film that we're going to see. Okay, let's lighten up a little bit and uh, just think about some of the other things that you're going to see in this film. So uh, my little pun here for lightening up was bioluminescence. <laughs> So you'll see this in, in Cameron's films, and actually it's a theme that he exploited to the extreme in Avatar. Many of the images in Avatar were uh, these kinds of uh, tenophores, uh, other uh, jelly-like organisms. This is only a few, uh, it's, uh, about an inch across or, or less, and they're producing light in, in rippling motions and so on over all colors of the uh, spectrum. So bioluminescence is really a, a wonderful sort of natural manifestation of these deep sea organisms. And as I said in the introduction, they probably serve many functions from um, acting as an attractor to try and uh, lure in a possible f food or prey, because it's got to find that in this inky blackness, to uh, finding a, another mate, thinking about it as a warning sign, we don't really understand the sensory apparatus that these organisms must have to be able to kind of access this light because they don't have eyes in the same way that we do. So there's, there's obviously some uh, well-elaborated um, machinery for these organisms to exploit the nature of bioluminescence, but it really is quite beautiful. And Cameron is a master of using this in his films. So finally, I'm going to conclude with two of the frontier areas of uh, our, our science. I'm going to start off with bacteria. Um, scientists at Bigelow Laboratory and elsewhere are trying to understand these primitive life forms in the deep ocean. They, uh, they've existed since life really started to form on the planet. They derive their energy from the metals and minerals that exist there. Uh, they can withstand very high temperatures in the close proximity to these, uh, hot, uh, these uh, hot chimneys. And at the same time, they can also exist deep in the sediment and the crust, surviving on the fluids that are circulating through the floor of the ocean. We think there's at least as much biomass in these small bacterium living in the deep ocean as there is in the whole of the terrestrial uh, uh, biomass on the, that we know as human beings. And yet we hardly understand what they do. We're probing into their uh, genetics and their biochemistry to try and understand their function. And in closing, I thought I would uh, show you a short video now. Um, it's uh, of something called a pyrosome. And a pyrosome is made of these gelatinous organisms that I was talking about before. I'm just going to show you the, uh, the video clip. And then, obviously, when we're watching The Abyss, we'll see some of this related by James Cameron in his film. He did not know that pyrosomes existed when he made the film. So that's, uh, that was pretty prescient of him. And finally, I'd also like to say that I'd be very happy to answer any questions at the end. So as the caption says, we're looking in underwater off the south coast of Australia. This is a real life organism. It's actually millions of micro south microorganisms joined together to form this tentacle that moves across the floor of the ocean. Fluids circulate through the tentacle, and that's how all these colonial organisms that form this actually derive their nutrients and food supply. This is a single salp now floating alone, just to, to give you the idea of one of these. And here they are joined together, a different type of tentacle this time, but forming this colony. These have hardly ever been seen by human beings. Now, I think there are only about three recorded observations of them in total in the world's oceans. 
So those of you who won the scuba diving training course, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is what you have to aim at, the ability to go down and share really a life-changing experience. But this is when they just break up and then swarm in the waters, uh, filling the waters with these uh, gelatinous microorganisms. So I'm going to conclude there. Um, I think The Abyss is a wonderful film. You're, you're going to have to sit through over two hours. I'm sure most of you have realized that. Um, <laughs> but uh, throughout it, you'll see in Cameron's eyes, through Cameron's eyes, uh, the wonder of the deep ocean, uh, man exploring the deep ocean. Uh, I'd like you to seriously record the fact that we know so very little about this part of our world, and yet we are now going to set forth and exploit the minerals that, w that we need for our society, but without many of the protections and understandings that we probably should have in place. And there are these wonderful organisms that live down there, uh, that have been there for many millions of years that we're just beginning to probe into now and to understand. So thank you very much indeed. Have a